Welcome to Time Tunnel Radio. From childhood's hour, I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw. I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source, I have not taken my sorrow. I could not awaken my heart to joy at the tone. And all I loved, I loved alone. Then, in my childhood, in the dawn of a most stormy life, was drawn from every depth of good and ill the mystery which binds me still. For nearly all his life, Edgar Allan Poe was a lonely, melancholy man. From childhood, he felt himself set apart from others. His parents were traveling actors, performing for audiences in the newly formed United States of America. In 1809, soon after Poe was born, his father disappeared. A year later, his mother died. Poe, age two, was an orphan. John and Frances Allen, a wealthy Virginia couple, took Poe into their fashionable home. They gave him comfort, money, travel, even a middle name. And yet, he still felt alone. Poe's loneliness, his feeling that he never belonged, led him to a lifetime search for beauty, for the beauty which he thought would reflect the heavenly paradise he would someday reach. In the spring of youth, it was my lot to haunt of the wide world, a spot the which I could not love the less. So lovely was the loneliness of a wild lake with black rock bound and the tall pines that towered around. But when the night had thrown her pall upon that spot as upon all, and the mystic wind went by murmuring in melody, then, ah, then I would awake to the terror of the lone lake. The model for the lake in this poem may have been the dismal swamp in Poe's boyhood Virginia. There is also a legend which says that the swamp is haunted by the ghost of a lover who, having lost his sweetheart, disappeared there. Poe's search for beauty often led him to deserted, quiet places, such as the swamp. In much of his poetry, the search takes place at night. At midnight, in the month of June, I stand beneath the mystic moon. An opiate vapor, dewy, dim, exhales from out her golden rim and... Softly dripping, drop by drop, upon the quiet mountain top, steals drowsily and musically into the universal valley. The lake, a conscious slumber, seems to take and would not for the world awake. All beauty sleeps. Poe's attempt to find beauty led him beyond the frequently obvious sights of nature to a deeper beauty, the beauty of the mind and of the human spirit. He said his poetry was based upon his, quote, burning thirst for supernatural beauty, unquote. Art, especially the art of ancient Greece and Rome, provided Poe with one form of the beauty he was searching for. His year as a student at the University of Virginia awakened him to classical art. When Poe entered the newly opened university in 1826, the grand design of its architect, Thomas Jefferson, had taken shape. In the symmetry of the Greek columns and the balance of the university's extended colonnades and walkways, Poe found the harmony and beauty of ancient architecture. Today, Jefferson's design remains unchanged, and the room where Poe slept and read is left empty. After he left the university, Poe wrote his tribute to classical art in his poem To Helen. Helen, thy beauty is to me like those Nicene barks of yore that gently o'er perfumed sea the weary, wayworn wanderer bore to his own native shore. On desperate seas long wont to roam, thy hyacinth hair, thy classic face, thy naiad airs have brought me home to the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. Lo, in yon brilliant window niche, how statue-like I see thee stand, the agate lamp within thy hand. Ah, Psyche, from the regions which are holy land. Poe addressed his poem to Helen of Troy. To the poet, she is ideal beauty, 
the human model of mystical beauty. Just as the man-made Parthenon is an artistic model of divine beauty. Poe was, in fact, fascinated by the Parthenon. The last spot on Earth's orb I trod upon was a proud temple called the Parthenon. Beauty clung round her columned wall. Beauty crowded on me then, and half I wished to be again of men. Poe believed that beauty in its purest form existed in the heavenly paradise. He was sure that man, because he is immortal, could achieve that paradise. He felt that a man could reach it through love of a woman. Poe wrote many love poems. Usually the woman he loves is dead. Because she is dead, she becomes a woman in heaven, and Poe's love for her, therefore, brings him closer to heaven. I fell in love with melancholy, and used to throw my earthly rest and quiet all away in jest. I could not love, except where death was mingling his with beauty's breath. Poe himself tells us that he mingled the ideas of death and beauty to achieve the sad and melancholy tone of his poetry. He wrote, Regarding, then, beauty as my province, my next question referred to the tone of its highest manifestation, and all experience has shown that this tone is one of sadness. Beauty of whatever kind invariably excites the sensitive soul to tears, The melancholy is thus the most legitimate of all poetical tones. Lost love is the central theme in many of Poe's poems. There are several unhappy incidents in his life to account for this. When living with his aunt in Richmond, Poe fell in love with the young and beautiful Sarah Royster. But her parents disapproved of Poe and forced her to marry another man. Several years later, Poe married Virginia Clem. His happiness was again doomed, for not many years after they were married... Virginia Clem died. I became insane with long intervals of horrible sanity. I drank. God only knows how often or how much. And as a matter of course, my enemies referred the insanity to the drink rather than the drink to insanity. Two years after Virginia's death, Poe returned to Richmond, where he once again met Sarah Royster, who by this time was a widow. Poe rekindled their love and proposed to her. She accepted. But before they could be married, Poe died. The tragic nature of his life is reflected again and again in his work, as in the poem called Annabelle Lee. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea, but we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. In the poem, Annabel Lee dies, but the poet feels that their love lives on. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in the sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. Poe's lost love, his loneliness, his frustration in the search for beauty, his mental anguish, all these things are brought to light in his most famous poem, The Raven. In the poem, we hear a young man's thoughts as he gradually goes mad. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, Suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping 
rapping at my chamber door. To some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly, I remember. It was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow. Vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Nameless here forevermore. The curtains in the room began to move. Terrified, the young man hesitates. Then, summoning his courage, he goes to the door and looks out. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this and nothing more. Turning back, the young man hears the tapping again. At first he thinks it is the wind. He goes over to the window. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, Prophet still, if bird or devil. By that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell the soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word, our sign of parting bird or friend. I shrieked up starting, get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting. Still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. <laughs>